just while he's uh, getting mic'd up, I'll introduce Simon Green. Uh, he's a Wachamero and Curandero who has worked for the past two decades in service to uh, a broad community, curing individuals and groups. Simon was a member of the original steering and advisory committee of and remains a research associate with the Ayahuasca Treatment Outcome Project and currently sits on the International Advisory Committee for Research to Reality, or R2R, Global Summit on Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Medicine. He's presented at a range of events and has always produced a number of lectures, also produced a number of lectures for, um, uh, and features for ABC Radio National on the subject of curing, including Icaros, Magical Songs from Peru. Uh, this song is from Ever Since, Songs for Wajalak Country and The Doctor Man's Liar. A lair, sorry, not liar. Um, the title of his talk today, The Problems of Throwing Out Babies with Bathwaters. Whose paradigms are we really shifting? I think he's good to go. Thanks very much, Simon. Too soon. Too soon. Thank, thank you. I'm not sure how my eyesight will hold for uh, reading of presenters' notes, so... I may walk around, I may stand at this lectern, but uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm, I've got an act to follow after Alison's presentation, uh, a similar explanation of title, but uh, just checking to make sure before some housekeeping. Uh, I have got images of, of deceased Aboriginal people, so for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, just be aware that that's coming. And if anyone's taking images of the slideshow, just refrain from taking those, if you would. Um, so Martin's given away much of my... much of what I was going to speak to at the outset. And um, as with uh, Alison's talk, I just want to explain the nature of, of, of my title. Originally, uh, the title of the presentation, which is on the throwing out of babies with bathwater, whose paradigms are we really shifting? Uh, originally, at the mooting of this suggestion, and that bio reflected that, the world was a much different place. We've been waiting three years to get here, I guess, and. Uh, the narrative structure of the world has changed and uh, I do want to thank all of the EGA mob for making such a Herculean effort to, to, to get us here. And uh, at the time of that, <laughs> and an adjustment there for the text size, so thank you very much again to the EGA AV team. Uh, the title given three years ago was The Problems of Throwing Out of Ontological and Epistemological Babies with Bathwaters, Traditional Medicines in the Context of Mental, Physical and Social Health and Their Divergences and Convergences with Western Scientific Clinical Concepts, uh, because I wanted to continue to examine some themes that I'd addressed in a presentation at Sikul Habana in 2018. And... Uh, it's a cumbersome title, and, and Ronnie uh, eventually contacted me uh, to ask me about its nature. Uh, but in, in Siko Habana in 2018, I'd, I'd presented, and Siko Habana uh, describes itself as the seventh international Siko Habana conference based at the psychiatric hospital of Havana, is held in Cuba every four years where the latest advances in psychiatry are presented, knowledge is exchanged, and future work strategies are drawn up. It's an international scientific event of great scientific value that has the presence and participation of prestigious foreign personalities in all fields and knowledge of psychiatry. So very straight psychiatry kind of uh, presentation. Uh, and the present, well, uh, conference, and the presentation I gave there with my colleague, Dr. Ilana Berlovitz, was entitled uh, Traditional Amazonian Peruvian Medicine in the Context of Mental Health, Divergences and Convergences with uh, Clinical Scientific uh, Western Concepts. And so I was continuing that theme in... in uh, in that title that I originally offered Ronnie, and, and as the presentation became, came closer, Ronnie contacted me to say, mate, it won't fit on the web page. Can you make it a little more, uh, well, a little less 
unwieldy. And uh, so the above adjustment was what I responded with on the throwing out of babies with bath waters, whose paradigms are we really shifting? And uh, I think it's fair to say that the Cuban mental health apparatus has a very distinctly different uh, attitude to psychedelics than, than the general culture and corporate excitement that we, we see in Australia today. Uh, and it was our intent at the time to challenge that dominant notion, to create paradigm shifts, if you will, and, and there's no small amount of irony uh, in the fact that I'm here today to, to suggest that we need to temper our enthusiasm in this context currently. So I'm, in that context, I'm no stranger to op occupying liminal spaces. I have been for a, for a good while, uh, but uh, not many of you will know me. I keep to myself. So, so just to give you an indication of that, for, for at least 25 years, I've, I've worked in the healing arts, and for 20, I've been deeply engaged with the, the entheogenic, so-called plant-based systems of curanderismo, of, uh, of Latin America as a curandero and, and more specifically as a huachumero. So I've worked with, with many curanderos in, in Latin America and as one over decades. And as you can see, but, uh, but more specifically, uh, I'm a huachumero. So whilst, however, I've done some of my best and deepest work intoxicated with this plant that you see surrounding me here, thanks, gracias, uh, San Pedrito, uh, the work that I do doesn't require the intoxication with that plant. And that's very much the case in systems of curing in cultures who use these quote-unquote psychedelics. And uh, the relationships that one establishes with that, this plant and other plants, at least by molecules in the immediacy, doesn't require an intoxication to function. And, and, and this is what I want to convey, and the only way that I can convey it is in regards to my own experience, yes, uh, because it's a subject that's not oft, oft discussed. Uh, so the fundamental point is those molecules teach us things, teach us things about the nature of the world, and they don't need to be ingested necessarily for those teachings and learnings to be brought into the world, and I want to, I want to uh, show you something of that. Now, uh, I've also, as well as that work in Latin America, uh, befriended and engaged with and worked alongside healers from the world's oldest continuous cultures here on my home continent for many years. And uh, I was interested in David Nichols' talk yesterday uh, with regards to Maria Sabina and so forth. And in that context, I don't know if anybody, any of you saw him, but in that context, I'm not appealing to authority here. I'm uh, rather presenting an indication of peer review. So as I say, worked as a curer in a manner that's recognisable to those folk as well as those folk in Latin America who name me thus. So these people presented on the uh, screen uh, call me by that name that represents that cure in that particular language, yes. But on the other side of that coin, despite not being a, an academic, I've engaged with academia uh, significantly, again, in a liminal space. Uh, I was a research associate, which Martin, I think, said in the introduction with the uh, Development Committee for Ayahuasca Treatment Outcome Project led by Dr Brian Rush. I was an advisor for the Global Ayahuasca Pro uh, Project at University of Melbourne and recently a member of the International Advisory Committee and Submission Review for Research to Reality Global Summit on Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Medicines. And uh, 
In amongst all that, I've been producing or have produced on a number of occasions radio for Radio National on the subjects of traditional healing and culture, again the titles of which uh, Martin introduced me with. And uh, <laughs> to add to all of that, I uh, collaborated with uh, Anna Elder Makata, Dr. Anna Elder Makata, Makata and uh, Dr. Peter Addy at uh, Tsapastora Org uh, to recount uh, tales of curing, particularly Tsapastora curers in the Sierra Mazateca. No? And those collaborations have, have led to cross cultural collaborations in 2015. I took, uh, I collaborated with ANTAC. Uh, and uh, took Ananu Nankri, Debbie Watson and Margaret Richards to the Encuentro Intercontinental de Líderes Indígenas sobre Adicción y Cultura, uh, so a, a specifically Indigenous-focused uh, addiction conference with representation around the world, from around the world. And aside, again, from all of that, I have a practice which is daily uh, my private practice where I've treated many thousands of conditions, but increasingly over the years, uh, increasingly psychedelic casualties, and that's the, the intent of my desire to communicate today. Uh, I don't get out much, as I say, and uh, every now and then the level of these harms and, uh, and injuries have... Uh, reached a crescendo such that I feel the need to publicly speak of them. So that process has, has led me to be known as that guy to send people to and, uh, when they have a psychedelic injury. And I'm not speaking... Uh, I'm speaking in a landscape where there's an injury that psychiatry, psychology and or the plants themselves can't address. Uh, and this is what I want to... Uh, address is the fact that there are these ontological landscapes that we're generally not addressing in the culture when it comes to psychedelics uh, that have a mechanism uh, that is well known elsewhere, but in the Western examination of psychedelics we're not really addressing, and there's a tremendous amount of harm that's occurring in the middle of that, and people are falling through the gaps of, of that. And so I'm in the unusual position of being that guy, and even more so of late, uh, being the guy who the people who have served people, particularly ayahuasca, uh, I see a lot of problems in that regard. I'm sent people, I say to clients who arrive with uh, significant problems, and I say, who sent you to me? The, the fellow that gave me the ayahuasca. Um, and often without, well, pretty much always, without doing me the courtesy of actually contacting me and and saying where their capacity to address what had been set in motion had, had ended. And again, not an appeal to authority, but just as a way of description or introduction of myself to you to suggest that I've been around this for a long, long time. And, uh, and I've witnessed time and time again in that long career the spiritual root of illnesses and at both an individual and a cultural level, and this is my endeavour to address that at a cultural level, uh, and the profundity of healing potential in, when we actually engage with the mediation between the unconscious and the conscious and between those other worlds that we inhabit with quote-unquote psychedelics or entheogens and this world. And and by which I mean specifically non-human worlds, persons other than humans, yeah? And the accounts are myriad uh, of those interactions with non-human worlds in both indigenous, indigenous traditional cultures, but also uh, in modern explorations of psychedelics. But there isn't much uh, talk about what that means, yes? We know of Rick Strassman's DMT elves or Mc Terence McKenna's DMT elves, uh, but we don't talk much about what do we do with that. And uh, despite the world's affirmations to me about in the course of that career over decades of the veracity and the authenticity of my observations and cosmovision, I don't have any definitive model. I don't have a, a uh, Ten Commandments to fix the, the uh, profound unwellness of our time for you, but... Uh, 
In fact, I'm extremely wary of such certainties. And uh, again, this is why I think that there needs to be a discussion in this context. But what I do have is story, as I say. I have uh, decades of experience and action, and I'd like to share with you uh, some of the tales of that landscape in the hope of inspiring change. And that change, my belief is, needs to uh, take place within the ontological structures writ large in the culture, and I would say profoundly buggering up our physical, mental, emotional, social and ge geological, geographical uh, bodies. So an ontological shift is profoundly needed, and that shift can't be mind-based alone. A lot of the folks in the, in the examination of psychedelics and plants is about changing minds, about psychology, uh, psychology and psychiatry and so forth. And, uh, and I think our shift of understanding of the mind and cognition and its place within our ecosphere is fundamental to the kinds of uh, healings that we need and the way in which we can most make these uh, substances available in a way that's, that's enacting the healing that we're talking about looking for. So this is something which traditional healing structures have known in the words of a now departed friend from ever since. And so uh, in his honour and in recognition of the countless human and non-human wisdoms and experiences which inform support for any new discoveries in the human realm, in the realm of art, science, culture, let me share some of those stories with you. Now, I will say that these are difficult stories. I want to address difficult mental health issues, including suicide, so uh, bear that in mind. These stories will ensue. So, to the, to the subtitle of my, of my talk, so why whose paradigms are we really shifting? One of the very common tropes that I see in regards to popular culture and quote unquote psychedelic medicine is that these substances offer a paradigm shift in particularly in psychiatric and psychology uh, models. And the evidence I see, as I've said, in the, in the cultural engagement with and the rollout of that is significantly different, I'm sure. You've all seen one of these in the last decade or so. Paradigm shift, paradigm shift, paradigm shift, paradigm shift, etc., and so on. And what I actually see. Uh, is not much evidence of paradigm shift. We're enacting and engaging the same societal models, same medicalisation, specialisation, uh, etc. And and to be sure, there's great promises in the field of psychiatric or psychi psychedelic medicines in terms of psychology and psychiatry, uh, and they're often announced with with this great, if uh, significantly unimaginatively repetitive fanfare. And as to uh, plant medicine retreats, which, which many thousands of people are, are flocking to with very little uh, knowledge about plant medicines other than they're the next big thing. Yeah. And uh, who doesn't want big healing, life transformation and insight? No. Unfortunately, uh, as is the case with the promises of the legitimate uh, medicalized and entrepre entrepreneurialized psychedelic space, those promises are not often fulfilled. And unfortunately, this quote that I have there uh, is from a case whose themes are, are very, very familiar to me, unfortunately very familiar to me. So this quote provided to me by uh, the partner of uh, Natalie, who eventually brought her to see me.
We heard about ayahuasca ceremonies being conducted in the Blue Mountains through a friend who kindly referred us to the shaman. The shaman told us, bring a big intention. This retreat offers a powerful opportunity to receive big healing, life transformation and insight. Natalie, after the ceremony, heard incessant voices and her increasingly frantic efforts to stop them uh, resulted in her being hospitalised. When she was explaining to the hospital staff that she was hearing these voices as a result of having taken ayahuasca, she was uh, sectioned and given powerful antipsychotics. These didn't aid her or resolve the symptoms, and they, but they did, in fact, cause a significant amount of follow-on uh, side effect, which caused her also considerable distress. And some months after her second hospital visit, Natalie's partner, Lauren, brought her to see me in, in Ballingen, and, and Lauren wanted to have some capacity to speak of this incident. So uh, such situations are very complex. There are indeed psychological mechanisms at play, but there are also other mechanisms at play which other ontological landscapes have the capacity to address uh, which are very hard to find resolve for in Australia without, uh, without uh, some inside knowledge, so to say. And in Natalie's first visit to me, she was convinced that these voices that she was hearing, that uh, the, the spirits that she felt wanted to take over her life were causing this movement disorder that, uh, that she was experiencing. She could barely stand. It was very difficult to treat her. She had to, she had to get up. She couldn't sit still. Had to get up and, and walk every 15 seconds or so, and it was causing her great distress. And now, obviously, the, the psychiatric hospital had given no credence to this notion uh, that she had. Uh, and I was cautious to say, well, this is a, this is a known, this akathisia is a known uh, side effect of uh, psychiatric medication, and that I thought in this instance, in that distress, that it was very difficult to conflate symptoms and say all of these symptoms are as a result of, of spirits or all of these symptoms are a result of some material uh, rationalist phenomena. Uh, so uh, this was borne out after seeing me. She's topped taking the psychiatric drugs, and the, the akathisia improved. But it was too much for, in fact, it was too much for Natalie to bear. I'm sorry, I'll take you back to that. No, the slides aren't functioning. But in any case, the, the damage wrought by the previous two hospitalisations uh, in the, in the medical, in the psychiatric system had, had proven too much, too damaging for the rest of uh, Natalie's uh, life and she took her own life, um, causing great follow-on impact for the rest of the community, psychedelic and otherwise, yes. Uh, and, and this is a very complex and sad situation, but unfortunately it's not... I'm not alone in this. Usually at this stage I, I make a caveat that I'm known as somebody can, who can address those issues, and so I do so. Uh, but I have colleagues in Europe who work for very well-funded harm reduction mechanisms, and I uh, see increasing reports from there specifically in relation to, particularly in relation to plant medicines, but obviously this, uh, this uh, relates across the board to, to um, psychedelics, of ongoing and increasing levels of harm. And, and so whilst it's a difficult subject to discuss, I did want to bring it today to bring to the focus of public discussion. We like to talk about the benefits of psychedelics, but we have to develop uh, a capacity to have a narrative about the difficulties, the shadowier aspect of those, and the fact that these aren't just, in my lengthy experience, aren't just psychological phenomena that people are meeting, and when we don't have the cultural mechanisms to describe those, uh, it's very difficult to find respite from them. So, in my experience in Latin America, had Natalie presented uh, the ayahuasqueros and ayahuasqueras of my uh, acquaintance would certainly have viewed that uh, as, as an intrusion from, from a sentient other and would have addressed it as such. And, and like Natalie, I don't know if that that uh, slide came up, but uh, I'm sorry, like Lauren, 
uh, I think I agree that the situation would have been very, very difficult, uh, uh, very, very different, had, had uh, Natalie had that experience, had that capacity to be addressed in that fashion in the early stages of that process for her. Uh, but in a culture that, that treats psychedelics in general and plant medicines as a paradigm shifting molecular process without any attendant need for shifting of those ontological or medical paradigms without any desire to understand the non-molecular processes of uh, impacts of relating to these realms beyond the constricts of our existing ontological perceptions there's a repetition of the same old injuries that we're looking for these substances to heal. Uh, and so the repetition of the problems that led the culture to be, become so excited about the potential of these substances in the first instance. Uh, now, of course, again, in this instance, and in many like it, the, the therapeutic situation is incredibly complex. Externalities inevitably, in any field, interact with internalities, with the internal landscape, which is its own incredibly complex uh, ecosystem of competing cells and molecules and muscle fibres and osteoblasts and schoolyard bullyings and bacteria and viruses and first heartbreaks and so on. And, uh, and the majority, the mapping and the mediating of, of these interactions is its own very complex endeavour uh, and, and one must again avoid throwing out babies with bath waters. And can I just have the, the bottom of those notes there? I was, in that regard, I was at a, I was speaking, I was at a funeral and speaking to a young man who had a bad back. His, his family I'd been uh, adopted into in order to have a relationship with the family, there was no lack of care, but there was a necessary adoption so that I was a person with whom everybody in that, in that uh, culture could interact. And he was complaining of a bad back because as a result of a car accident that he'd had, which was caused by, by black magic. And uh, I said, sure, the magic may have caused the water buffalo to be standing in the middle of the road, while you came round the corner, but uh, your tyres were bald and you were driving too fast. And there's room for nuance, yes? So in that situation, one can't... Uh, we have to have this discussion in order to work out where those boundaries lie. And so one, there, is a, there is a landscape in which people will talk about spirits and black magic and so forth, but much of the... Uh, complexity of psychological function is like babies with bathwaters thrown out in, in these uh, cases. And so I'm, I'm talking about a landscape in which these different perspectives, different worldviews can, can have some interaction uh, without having to say ipso facto that doesn't exist. And much of the problem I see in that notion, particularly in this underground n notion or landscape, uh, where there's a misunderstanding of the nature of shamanisms, there's a glamorising of the nature of shamanisms. Uh, but if you take a cursory glance at, uh, at the literature on the subject, you'll see that it's not uh, glamorous at all. The, the shaman is a liminal being. He's a mediator between this and the other world. His presence is betwixt uh, and between the human and, and soup natural, incarnating the, the ancestor, suffering from severe punishments in the afterworld. He moans with pain, asking for pacifying rituals. Off duty, however, the shaman's charisma fades away. He tends to be socially peripheral and morally ambiguous. His life full of traumatic incidents such as illness, divorce and poverty. And uh, that's a quote randomly taken from the literature, the academic literature, but you will see that time and time again. And this isn't the, no, the, nature, uh, the nature in which uh, the popular culture views shamanisms. It's defined as something glamorous, something morally superior or some, some such. But these are uh, landscapes of ambivalent power. And uh, 
whilst those environments don't uh, appear particularly glamorous or desirable, desirable to me, they're, they're contained within a cultural understanding of the way things work and, and, and how knowing can be had and how it can, can heal. And this can be contrasted with uh, the terrain of neo-shamanic ayahuasca use, for example, in Australia, which has been described in the anthropological uh, literature as whatever you want to believe, kaleidoscopic individualism. And Alex, in fact, presented yesterday, who was the author of that uh, paper that used that title. And so much of the narrative around the positive impacts of those molecules misses, what it does miss is, is that, as I mentioned earlier, in the structures of traditional uses of these compounds, there are, there are very large bodies of information uh, and knowledge built up around doctoring with these, with these subjects, which are shared from teacher to student and from student to plant, uh, a plant to human, in a way that's not, not solely, as I said at the outset, relatable or related to the ingestion of the plant. Curanderos cure, they may be divinely intoxicated in a, in a learning and or curing context, but during the quotidian practice of curing, they're, they're going about their days and curing with the methods learned in those liminal spaces. Uh, and, that, and that's not solely related to the ingestion of the fungi, the, the plant, the molecule. And uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, that, that introspective, self-directed, even recreational engagement with these plants and molecules can't be extremely useful or indeed transformative. And, and I'm not suggesting that molecules can't be taken for diversion or, or enjoyment or recreation. Uh, but the categorization of a shaman, quote unquote, as akin to a bartender who can serve someone ayahuasca one night, wachuma the next, and 5-MeO-DMT the next, continues, in my experience, to cause great suffering and, and confusion. Shamanisms, as I said, are realms of ambivalent power and curing operates in the same realm as healing and uh, as harming and much, much harming is occurring. Uh, we've seen much debate in the academic psychedelic community in the last year or so about how that the once heterodox positions become the orthodox and, and structures of power, and again, David Nichols spoke to this yesterday, structures of a, a power and exclusion of personal narratives uh, are made that those, those heterodox positions initially challenged. And, and again, this is why I'm presenting this narrative here today. It's not my forte, but I'm here because this narrative needs to be given some oxygen in the public space because it isn't and, and harms are occurring very significant harms, and it's very, very sad. My intent here today is to share experience to alleviate human suffering, and this is, this is my role as cura, as curandero, and so I'm expressing this with that desire, as I say, to inspire people to think differently, which, in a way, that may help to alleviate human suffering. Um, and I've, I very much... Uh, uh, seen that process in the, in the underground neo-shamanic uh, so-called landscapes where the same has occurred, where the person's experience, such as Natalie, uh, who was widely rejected from that landscape, when, when the narrative doesn't match the narrative of the healing circle, uh, then people are often abandoned. Uh, Thomas Nagel said, but the success has gone to the materialists' heads from a fruitful method materialism becomes an axiom. If science can't quantify something, it doesn't exist, and so the subjective, unquantifiable, immaterial, manifest image of our mental life is proved to be an illusion. Now, there's a good deal of use of the phrase, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence from scientists when they're meeting claims about action at a distance or traditional healing mechanisms or the intrusion of external uh, energetic objects into a human. But of course, these phenomena have, have been the ordinary experience of humans uh, and the, ma the majority, in fact, of human knowings in the world. 
and even the repeated observations of generations of healers, subsequent hypothesis and repetition of result when applying said hypotheses are deemed unscientific. Despite following the tenets of scientific inquiry, huge sample sizes in longitudinal studies of centuries' durations are dismissed out of hand because the propositions are considered ipso facto nonsensical. I'm ramping up aware of time. As I said earlier, I have repeated observations of uh, human experience of the validity of these indigenous ontologies and epistemolo epistemological perspectives functioning unperturbed unperturbed in the landscape that denies their existence. Uh, and here, for example, uh, is, a, is an account I want to share with you of a client that I didn't know prior to their illness and who knew nothing of me of my, or of my manner of working and technologies therein. His daughter was a client. Uh, she contacted me to say that her father had contracted uh, the COVIDs in Czech Republic 2019 when the order of the day was to send people home if their lips turned blue, take them to hospital, put them on a uh, ventilator, which occurred with this man. And she asked me if uh, I could give him my attentions knowing that I regularly worked at a distance. And uh, I did so and some weeks later he was revived and almost immediately to his daughter recounted this, this tale that I'm about to show you. And uh, when I contacted him some Weeks later in the rehabilitation hospital, his eyes nearly fell out of his head. That's the guy I saw in my coma dream. And uh, whilst Yuri actually gave me permission to uh, play this entire video, he, it was a very emotional experience for him. So I'm going to read his translation. His daughter said he might be a bit embarrassed uh, if this were uh, put on the internet. So, but I'll play you his introduction. Těžký COVID-19 a byl jsem v umělém spánku. A měl jsem zažitek ve spánku v podobě snu nebo mimo tělo, jestli jsem byl. I'll read to you his account, which said it was taking place in front of the hell and behind demons and the devil there was a light coming from the ground like the red hot lava. Everything was happening in the dark but the light lightened the space up where I was. So there were demons and there was light and the devil was standing a little way off watching it. The demon had thick buffalo horns twisted like this and a goat's face here and more human here and there was red in his face and he had a cloak all the way down or there were dark wings on his back. He stood motionless there and just watched it with his eyes. His eyes was moving from to the side and he looked at us, looked at me and those demons in that direction and, and he watched as the demons, all four of them, went for me. They stretched out their hands for me like that and their fingers were wavy. Those fingers were so transparent, green, yellow, coloured, looked like pieces of cloth, Yuri said. And he always chased away... Uh, and when the demons were already close, a man appeared. He was dancing and turning and waving a blanket like this and he always had chased away the demons forcefully and blew smoke from his mouth. And there was a fire near to him, rather a small one, he said. And so he was dancing as if he was jumping and turning in a clockwise direction and the demons began to repeat, retreat as if he'd driven them away. Suddenly demons were tens of metres away from me and the person, as I would describe him, had his hair tied in a ponytail. He had dreadlocks that were waist length or below his shoulder blades. Well, then he chased them away. The last look, the memory was seeing Simon and in the end, nothing. Then I woke up and my daughter told me about Simon and when we called each other I recognised it was him who I saw in that dream or when I was out of my body. And what's most telling to me in that instance, and I've got a very short uh, amount of time left, I want to play you another, but is that the man knew nothing of me or my manner of working in that ceremonial space, but he very accurately described not only my physical appearance, but the manner of working, which includes the blowing of uh, tobacco to, to chase away demons, yes. I wear a ceremonial poncho, which is a blanket with a hole cut in it, and I work with a fire uh, and dance around it in a circular manner. Uh, so the, you can make all sorts of, of uh, explanations as to why that could be so, but uh, Occam's razor demands that we, uh, we take the simplest possible explanation. I haven't to wind up from... from uh, from MC, so I'll continue. This second 
uh, that I wanted to speak to you. I, I can't speak, to, I could speak to you of many hundreds and thousands of these kinds of cases that don't make sense with a materialist ontological perspective. Uh, but I don't have time to... This account is from a Peruvian GP whose son became ill with a fever. His father was a client and so he emailed me to tell me of his son's illness. Uh, he presented symptoms of food poisoning and because he was a healthy child, they assumed that he would get better. Uh, rapidly, he didn't. They took him to emergency. The paediatrician said he had an ear infection. Uh, gave them antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. They took him home. He didn't improve, but in fact got much worse. They took him to an ear specialist. The ear specialist said uh, he didn't have an ear infection, but instead gave him, despite not being able to diagnose him, gave him further antibiotics and sent him home. He continued to decline. The parents, uh, in some distress, contacted me. And here's his mother, who is, as I say, a GP herself, her, uh, his mother's uh, account of that. So we got very lost, not knowing what exactly to do, and very uh, desperate because we were seeing our little son getting worse, like if something was eating him from inside. So my husband um, suggested to call or send Simon an email, knowing that maybe we wouldn't receive a reply straight away because we know Simon is a very busy person. But luckily, we got a reply, and he was able to um, do his work on Alta that night. We live very far away, we live in Peru, so the work was remotely. Um, I don't really know what he did that night, but next day, our son started to feel much better. His diagnosis was mal aire, what in, uh, in English is bad air. So this bad air or mal aire was manifesting in his body as an infection and um, that's why he was having all these symptoms. So that night he did a work on our son and next day he was feeling much better and the following day he was back to normal. Um, to the playful, funny little guy, he's always, he was always like that. Um, so I'm recording this video to to manifest. You might need our to pull that sound, Stu. I'll have to finish up there. Uh, but the point is that action at a distance, uh, the the medical uh, facilities, the Western ontologically based uh, medical processes couldn't address the incidence of this child's illness. He was diagnosed and acted upon by a curandero, yours truly, from afar, and his condition Im immediately improved, and that uh, person went on to describe that she, as a doctor, uh, sometimes has to grant that there's, there's landscapes outside of that uh, healing process that need to be addressed, and that there's not necessarily language for in the modern Western uh, oeuvre. I did have more to say about academics, but I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. There is some discussion of this in the academic landscape, which is heartening about the necessity to look at uh, the spirits of these molecules that we're interacting, the spirits of these plants, uh, and more of that needs to happen. I'm sure there's a good deal, but more needs to happen. Thank you very much. I got some sound. Thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your deep experience in this very insightful um, okay. talk. Um, we do actually have a bit of extra time, so I might ask a question to lead us off. Um, and then I've got a couple coming through as well. Oh, yeah. So don't forget, everybody, you can log into Slido, slido.com, uh, and you can use the number 6495524, and you can send your question through to me. But just to start us off, Simon, um, I think your point about um, heterodoxy and orthodoxy was really a, a, a very strong one to me. Um, and I guess that could lead into what you were going to say about academic discourse and the academics generally. So how do you feel that we can safeguard that that sort of heterodox, um, you know, that diversity of, of views and to give them equal um, equal validity or at least time in, in the discourse and, uh, and how can we safeguard that, that um, open uh, conversation as time goes on, particularly over the last five years since there's been such a shift in, um, in everything towards medicalisation and, um, and away from the, you know, from the kind of basis that you've been talking about. Yeah, thanks, Martin. I don't know if I've still got sound. Yep. Can you hear me? I think you 
Um, I think that uh, that's a big question. What, what I was going to go on to say, I was going to show some uh, slides that some academics had presented to me. I know of a number of academics. Uh, Dr. Olivia Marcus, a medical anthropologist, is starting to speak in these landscapes, these conferences about... Uh, about indigenous ontologies and spirits of plants, that the action of these healing mechanisms aren't molecular, that they, the, the, the spirits of the plants has, have, to be, uh, have to be engaged with. Dr. Ilana Berlovitz, who I mentioned in my presentation at Sikoabana with, also in her doctorate presented these landscapes as a given, artfully I would say, and said this is how this system works and it has an interior... Uh, and uh, an internal coherence. This is how it works. This is how the curanderos say it works. And as far as her paper suggested, it works, yes. The data showed that. And she won the uh, Inga Sala Prize for Excellence in Research for Psychiatry in, in Switzerland. So there is a space for these narratives in academia. But I've also spoken to countless uh, academics who I say, surely you've, you've worked with ayahuasca, ayahuasqueros, huachumeros in Peru, you know that the songs, the directing of tobacco smoke, the breath is fundamental to those healing processes. There's something going on. Why aren't you speaking about this in the academy? And they say, I couldn't, I'd lose my funding, I'd lose my licence to practice psychology. And one point I was speaking to somebody, have we got time? One point I was uh, speaking to somebody yesterday uh, in the accommodation with regards to that. Uh, one such person said I would lose my practice to uh, my license to practice clinical psychology if I introduced spirituality. And I said, Well, there's your first chauvinism, the first error, ontological error, because those curanderos aren't speaking of the, that wachuma as a spiritual process that they've developed in their own head. That's another being with whom they're having a relationship. And uh, when we can start to talk honestly about that, and I think a lot of the rejection and, and difficulty in talking in the, in the broader cultural landscape or in the, intellect, uh, in the academic landscape is actually intellectual laziness. It just says, well, we can't talk about that. That whole subject is too difficult. Let's not talk about it. And, and I think that needs to change. I mean, that just re also reflects our reductionist, you know, just the, the, the paradigm within which we're working, I guess, at all times, from the Western perspective anyway. So. Well, it's odd because we, we have this n n notion of inclusivity and diversity, and yet what I wanted to say in closing was that that we've seen the evidence with agriculture, monoculture in agriculture, and yet in this landscape we're developing a, a monoculture of mind, and, and this, this threatens to suck out all of the very things that could heal the cultural illness. Yeah. No, thanks very much. Okay, we've got a couple of questions coming through, which is great. Uh, in your many years of deep experience, what mistakes have you personally made and what did you learn? Uh, many mistakes and... Uh, Somebody, probably misappropriately coined, suggested somebody, I think it was attributed to um, Winston Churchill, but as I say, with many quotes, it's probably misattributed, but he said something to the effect of that a successful person is somebody who moves from mistake to mistake enthusiastically, or failure to failure enthusiastically. And so in response to the question, uh, one of the significant questions, uh, one of the most pronounced problems I've made is to not take the subjects that I'm speaking to seriously. So, for example, in regards to harm, as I said, uh, shamanisms are landscapes of ambivalent power, power to harm, power to heal, and my naive, open-hearted uh, engagement with those realms left me in very, very serious strife, having been struck with a, a virote, a magical projectile, uh, which took me many years to find a curandero of significant capacity who was eventually Taita Kerubin uh, of the chief of the Kofanes, who I heard just two days ago is 110 or thereabouts, 112 now still alive. Uh, I'm very heartened to hear. He was about 103 at the time, and he uh, extracted, he, he and his son and, and another Taita, extracted this uh, virote, 
uh, in a process which took uh, three or four sessions of Yahé, no? And, and this was uh, Taitas with collectively 200 years of experience. Uh, so there's not quick fixes for these processes. When somebody has a, a, a problem with an ayahuasca circle in the Dandenongs or some such, we can't expect that there's a, uh, a quick fix. We have to have reasonable, well-rounded space for these problems to be afforded or be addressed. Uh, next question is, um, can we in the West develop cultural mechanisms to support difficult psychedelic experiences and what would that look like? Uh, they're concerned about a, a cultural appropriation, but I think you've touched on that just this very second. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to follow through. Uh, anything further to add to that? Uh, otherwise, I've got probably three or four other questions. Uh, I don't, again, I don't think it's a quick fix. I think we need to have very difficult conversations and... and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we need to have difficult conversations and they're going to be, there's going to be lots of arguments. Uh, the issue of, for example, the, the warning for uh, imagery of deceased uh, indigenous people. Uh, the, the daughter of one of the people who I uh, presented said, yes, no problem, but nonetheless, because of cultural protocols, so the family member said, yes, no problem to show that, but I had to... Uh, use the protocol of the time, which is to make that warning so complicated. Thank you. Uh, could you expand on what you mean by the term ambivalent power? I mean that there's uh, power to heal, power to harm. It's, an, it's a landscape of power uh, that isn't good per se. So there's a popular cultural notion that uh, shamanisms are landscapes of, they're kind of equated with some kind of religious guru or some, some such, but they're actually landscapes of technology uh, that's learnt, energetic technology, technology in relation to the other than human world and mediation between those worlds. And, and those powers can be used to harm as well as heal. And, and there are landscapes, for example, in the uh, Amazonian landscapes, that's a matter of course, that attack sorcery and curing go hand in hand and they're part of a balanced whole, and, and one can't be separated from the other. Uh, and unfortunately, if that's not understood, then people attracted to power will then become attracted to, and, and these uh, unexamined psychological desires for power will be amplified in these psychedelic spaces. And as I say, in the cultural discourse, or the academic cultural discourse at least, the psychedelic discourse, we've seen that over the last 12 months, and even recently there was a, a, um, quite a heated internet debate about somebody's, uh, a prominent psychedelic uh, member, community member's uh, bullying behaviour. So, so uh, like all landscapes, there's lots of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we see that play out in many, in, in many ways on many levels as well, don't we? But yeah. yeah, very good point. Uh, can you say a bit more about the ontological space you touch as a curandero? Well, I'm talking to landscapes that, and, and I'm, not, I'm not clever. Some people call me a clever, but I'm not clever in the academic lingo, and I, so I can't really speak to that in a, uh, in the landscape of Western uh, philosophy. But fundamentally, those ontologies are ones where humans are alive in a, in a universe that is alive and populated with other persons. And those persons might be mountains, they might be cacti, they might be lianas, they might be hagua, they might be whatever. And the society, the culture needs to be respectful of that and be having an ongoing dialogue between those uh, landscapes. And some of, those, some of those sentient others are ambivalent to humans, they, uh, some couldn't care less, some are overtly hostile and some are benevolent and helpful to humans. So it's a very broad landscape, but that's, that's the ballpark of where I'm speaking. Um, Simon, what do you think about establishing a recognised non-sectarian ethical framework that could be adopted by medicine people on a voluntary basis? I th I would like to see people take, make that responsibility themselves uh, personally and, and learn from those plants that they're taking or those psychedelics that they're taking. 
the problem of the formulation of a document, of a framework, of a standard, is what I've just spoken to, that, that, that heterodoxies become orthodoxies and there's a necessity to follow a protocol. If that's not embodied, if that's not heartfelt, uh, and simply trying to read off the presenter's notes, it's not going to work. And so I'd like to see uh, perhaps perhaps uh, there's certainly oodles of cultural mechanisms that speak of good ways to be. So I would just uh, suggest that people endeavour to be good people, both uh, in all landscapes and, and act with self-responsibility. Uh, how about... Um, from Faith again, can orthodox psychiatric medicine learn or consider healing as in metaphysical medicine, uh, minimum dosing, anthroposophy, uh, homeopathy and psychotherapy? I, th I think, of, of course. I mean, no one is in, under any illusion uh, of the uh, problems of, and it's, it's recently been in the media in terms of uh, the failings of SSRIs, for example, in depres uh, depression models. No one's under any illusion that there's a imbalance in the psychiatry landscape, that uh, agendas and narratives and frameworks are pushed by very large vested interests and even people who perhaps may not have had those vested interests when they became a part of that structure then are pulled into that uh, system, which uh, speaking of ambivalent powers uh, and the landscapes of healing and, and witchcraft, brujeria in my particular context, uh, sounds very similar, yes? One can diet with a plant, for example, that can give you the power to uh, heal, but it, there might be a, a plant that has a very narrow uh, window of application, may give you great power, but the danger of falling off that razor's edge of moral behaviour is high, and so people won't diet with that that plant because they, they uh, don't wish to become brujos or witches and, and I think the same exists in the psychiatric landscape, in the biomedical industry as a whole. Big money, uh, big, big uh, seductions. Okay, very, very quick question and then I think it's going to be a one word answer. Should research companies cashing in on their knowledge um, be supporting the threatened indigenous people who have been keepers of the knowledge for centuries? Yes. Fantastic. Simon, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your uh, patience. As a public speaker, I'm a good curandero, so <laughs> thanks for your patience with me. That's been wonderful. Thanks so much, Simon. Thank you,